longer goes to church. He no longer prays. He no longer associates himself with anything Christian. Why? Because his Christianity was all about getting what he wanted out of life. And when it didn't work the way exactly he wanted to control it, he bailed. Well, that's the picture of the older son. And I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there. I mean, I grew up, I was in church the, you know, like the first week of my life, right? <clears throat> and I went to Sunday school and church. I mean, every week we were there. Matter of fact, they used to give out little pins, yes. right, for perfect Sunday school attendance. Anybody else? Okay, a couple of older people here, you know. Uh, we had those pins. <clears throat> and if you were, they kept track of you, you know, if you were in attendance or not. And if you could get perfect attendance, that would, and you got an excuse if you were like in the hospital, all right, or the second coming happened. But those are the only two reasons why, you know, you wouldn't be in church on Sunday. And so I had perfect attendance pin. Yeah. All right. Yeah, baby. <laughs> now, if you were, had perfect attendance for two years in a row, the second year you got a little wreath that went around the outside of the pin. <laughs> And the next year, if you had perfect attendance for three years, you got a little three-year bar yes. that you hung. I had perfect attendance and a wreath and three oh. bars. Oh. <laughs> ask, ask Denny Taylor about this. That's what I'm talking about, all right? That's what I'm talking about. When did you get the one? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'm telling you, you know, there, there's that, yeah, I was pretty proud of that. And I lorded it over a lot of my friends, yeah. <laughs> you know, can't even make it to Sunday school. What a wimp, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, there's, you get that, you know, religious thing going. We used to do this thing, too, you know, like we used to have a Bible drills. You know what a Bible drill is? Okay, a Bible drill is when everybody has their Bible on their lap, right? And their Sunday school teacher says, okay, uh, first one to look it up and find it and read it. You're the winner. You get a candy bar, right? So you're like, okay, we're ready to go, ready to go, right? And then he says, okay, Leviticus 14, 3. Wham! You know, you just, you just jump right. Bam! I got it, right? And the first one you stand up, I would always win those things, you know? <laughs> I would always win those drills. Because I knew where every book of the Bible was, man. And I didn't have one of those cheater Bibles. You know, those cheater Bibles that have like little thumb things in them, you know, with all the things. None of that stuff, man. No, you know. Those guys were cheaters, right? They were cheaters. You know, I was arrogant. I was proud of the fact that I was good. Okay? You see, it's easy to wind up there. And it's easy to mistake the fact that maybe some things have gone okay in your life as a result of your goodness. But the Bible says it rains in the just and the unjust. I mean, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to get cancer. Doesn't mean that your life isn't going to fall apart. Right? I mean, bad things happen to good people. It's just the way it is. But without the bad things happening to good people, our character wouldn't be refined. Because the Bible says in the New Testament that character is refined by trial. I mean, I would love it if I could be refined by eating ice cream. I mean, that would just be off the charts huge, right? Yeah. But it doesn't work that way. The, the things that you learn that refine your character are sometimes the hardest things that you go through in life. So it's, it's a part of what life is about, is the good and bad, and you take it in and you say, you know what, it's, it's cool that God can be with me through this to refine me. But here we have two people as an example for us, and one is blatant sin, yeah, we get that, you know, but this kind of subversive attitude that grows from being good Okay? It's a way to control. And I, at the bottom of it all is the, is the original sin. Is that idea that we wanted to control God somehow. We wanted to usurp His authority. Because Satan comes and he says, you know what? God's holding back on you. He knows that if you eat from this tree that you'll be just like Him. And what does that infer? It infers that you can be in control. You now can shape the destiny of everybody and everything around you. And I don't know if anybody else here has control issues, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you wake up in the morning, you think, if everybody would just do what I tell them to do, the way that I tell them to do it, the world would just run smoother. Yes. All right? Everybody's, everybody's nodding their head. This is just terrible, all right? 
You know, but we get there and we think, okay, you know, if I'm good, then people should agree with me. People should do it the way I know it should be done. And life, and, and, and at the very base of sin, is this idea of taking control away from the father. The younger son did it by demanding his inheritance to do, live his life the way he wanted to without any rules and regulations. The older son said, you know what, I'll abide by your regulations, but I still want what I want. If I'm good, I deserve what I get, and nobody else is going to take it from me. So we can wind up in either of the camp, and I think we've probably experienced a little bit of both in all of our lives, right? But the bottom line for these guys is that they wanted their life and their things more than they wanted a relationship with their father. You see, they used their father to get what they wanted. And if they couldn't get what they wanted, what did they do? They distanced themselves. Even the older son did this. Because what happens when the younger son comes back and dad throws a party? The first thing he says is, I'm not going in. He gets angry. He gets mad. This is not fair. Anybody else have fairness issues, right? Okay. Yeah, that's not fair. I've said that before. I don't know if you have. My younger daughter said it all the time. Yeah, okay. My daughter, she's like, that's not fair, dad. You know? And so, as a good parent, I always said what good parents do say. What? How come we all know that? How come we all know that? Life isn't fair. And isn't it wonderful that it isn't fair? Because if we all got what we deserved, wow. Okay? If we got what we deserved, I would have a toasty rear end. Okay? I mean, yeah. See, we all know that we've been bad at a time or two or more. And so, you know, thank God that it, he's not fair. He's just. He's just. Sin had to be paid for, and Jesus paid the price of our sin. So he's just. But what we don't keep in mind often enough is that that justice comes at a price. At a price of his son dying in our place. And so we don't deserve any favor from God. But he chooses through his own method of, of justice for sin, of sacrifice of his son. He allows us then to have mercy, right? That's a great deal. But, you know, as Christians, I think we, we lean into this whole teeter-totter Christian idea, you know. If I live good enough, God owes me. You know, how come you're not answering my prayers, God? I'm trying my best here. I read my Bible four days in a row. Okay? So that deserves something. And we weigh down our side of the teeter-totter. We think eventually God's going to be owing us something. And all the blessings are going to slide down our way. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And I think that is probably the greater sin. What Tim Keller says, he says nearly everyone defines sin as breaking a list of rules. But Jesus here shows us that a man who, violated, who violated virtually nothing on the list of moral misbehaviors can be every bit as spiritually lost as most immoral people. Why? Because sin is not just breaking the rules. It is putting yourself in the place of God, Savior, Lord, and Judge, just as each son sought to displace the authority of his father in his own life. You get it? When we want to be in charge, when we want to take control, when we start judging other people and looking down at them as less than us, less important and less good, less knowledgeable, we're on very thin ice. Because at that moment, what we're saying is, I'm better than so-and-so, and I deserve better than so-and-so. I deserve more. And so that struggle for, for fairness, right? I mean, how do we react when life isn't fair? Okay? You say, whoa, time out, dude. You know, how come mine gets jacked up and I got to jump over the higher fence? Evidently, God must think that you've got what it takes to be able to do it with his strength. He doesn't give you more than you can handle, right? And so sometimes if life doesn't seem fair, maybe we should take that as a compliment and say, wow, God thinks enough of me that I can be able to do this with his strength. That's going to be cool. 
instead of thinking about as, as we got shortchanged, right? But here, what happens to the older son? There's a, there's a progression here. He becomes angry. He refuses to go in. He distances himself from his father and saying, I'm not going in. I'm not going to celebrate with you. I'm not going to have anything to do with this because I disagree with what you're doing. And then he, he starts exaggerating. He says, I've been slaving for you, right? And then he goes to the, the real exaggeration. You never gave me even a little goat to celebrate with my friends. You tell me that this father, who seems to be a pretty good guy in my estimation, never threw him a birthday party or anything. I mean, just the fact, the fact that they had beef, they had cows, I mean, showed that they probably ate pretty well. I mean, every day this older son was benefiting from his father's goods. I mean, every day in their world was probably a celebration compared to the rest of the world that was poverty-stricken. And so, you know, he goes to this exaggeration. Now, none of you have ever exaggerated, right, when you're angry? Right? I've told you a thousand million times! <laughs> right? You always do this. You never do this. Right? Th those, are, those are words that come from, out of anger. When we're upset when we didn't get our way and things didn't roll our way, we think, oh man, and then all of a sudden, whew, we blow things out of proportion so much that it justifies our distancing ourselves from the other person. Right? And then he says this. He, it's really interesting. If you look at the scripture, it says the older brother refers to his brother as this son of yours. It's not my brother. It's that son of yours. <laughs> it's like, you know, when our kids would go bad, right? I would always tell Janice, that daughter of yours, <laughs> you know, right? We want to distance ourselves from the, from the person that we're mad at, right? And what's interesting, the father's response says, this brother of yours. He reminds him, this is your brother. Okay? He, he corrects him. And what's interesting now is that the, old, the father, he, in his gracious response, again, it was a jaw dropper for the people that were listening. Because any son that would be insolent enough to get in his father's face and say, listen, dude. He doesn't even refer to him as father the way that protocol would have required him to address his father. Okay? He should have responded with this gracious response saying, you know, father, you know, and then talked with him. But instead he just gets in his face. A son that would do that in that culture deserves as big of a beating as the son who said, give me my inheritance, I'm out of here. He should have been beaten and thrown out of the family. For that kind of insolence. But instead, the father responds graciously, and, and people will say, What? No father responds like that. Okay? But what does he do? He pleads with him to join the celebration. He says, You know what? Please, please, please reconsider. Think about it. This is your brother that was dead, and now he's, he's been brought back to life. He's part of our family. Right? And, and now, what's really interesting is that Jesus just ends right there. I mean, the story's done. And I can imagine the people that are listening to the Jesus spin this story. I mean, they got the end of the story with the bad guy. Now, what about the good guy? What did he do? And Jesus just ends it. And the reason he ends it is because we are the ones who write the end of the story. Every one of us have the choice. How are we going to respond when we think that life isn't fair, when God hasn't been good enough to us, and we, even though we've been trying? How are we going to respond? Are we going to respond like this older brother? Are we going to keep an arm's length distance from God and God things? Or are we going to say, wow, okay, even though I've been trying to be good, I, I can't be judged. I can't go around judging other people. I can't be mad at people. I, I can't keep them at a distance and disown them, if you will. See, our relationship with God is not about control. It's not about getting things our way. It's about understanding that we are all under God's mercy. We are all under His grace. Jesus tells another story about, I call it the publican and the sinner, right? And it's actually the Pharisee and the sinner. I remember hearing the, this message from a country preacher one time, and I I didn't think he was that great of a preacher, but man, the, the message is like, wow. 
it, it rocked me. Because here, this one guy who's a Pharisee, who's, he's like a churchgoer, right? He's standing in the temple and he's looking into heaven. He says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy over there. And he's pointing to the, the little sinner guy who's in the corner. And it says that the sinner was on his knees beating his chest and just saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus says, so which prayer do you think that think God heard? And of course, the, the response from the crowd, well, of course, this guy's. And Jesus makes the point that when we put ourselves in a place of self-righteousness, we think we're being pretty good. We're putting out a lot of effort, a lot of energy to do this God thing and that God deserves, God owes me. Or we start looking down on other people as less than us, less deserving than us, not as good as us, not as smart as us. Then I think we, we wind up in this position over here and say, ah, oh, God, I, I'm grateful that I'm not like those people or that guy. I'm better than he is. Then we're on thin ice. And so it's a message to us. It's a message that is an Old Testament message. In Psalm 18, 27, it says, You save the humble, God, but bring low those who, are, who have haughty eyes or who are proud. Or Psalm 25, 9 says, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them His way. And Jesus uh, says in Matthew 23, 12, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be will be exalted. There's this idea that, that if we will just approach life with humility, you know, just forgive with humility, knowing that you've been forgiven. Be generous with humility, knowing that whatever you have came from God's hand. Okay? Um, just live your life in a gracious fashion that just elevates the other and diminishes yourself, right? The Bible says, I, I, want, I want God to increase and me to decrease. Right? I want, what he's saying in that is that I want nature and all of creation to get back to the right place. That God can be God and we can be the creatures that are created by God to be loved and to be able to love in return. And so Jesus says, Listen, all these rules, all these regulations, they're all fine and dandy, but they all boil down to one thing. Loving God and loving people. All the Ten Commandments are based on relational law. They all have to do with relating to either God or other people. And how you're supposed to be loving, compassionate, filled with grace and mercy. Like that grace and mercy that's been shown to you. So this is a hard teaching for us. To stay in that place of knowing that we've been forgiven and we don't deserve anything, but just we need to be gracious and learn that we are invited to celebrate. Celebrate our own salvation, but celebrate it any time that somebody else comes back. You know? And put the resources out there that God's giving you to do it. Man, that's even better. All right? Okay, let's pray. God, thank you that you love us. Um, we know that we are probably prone to, uh, after being forgiven, working real hard at trying to be good. And God, we, we ask your for forgiveness when we step into that place where we uh, think we're a little bit better than somebody else because we work so hard at being good or that we have the right idea about something and somebody else doesn't. Um, God, we are, we are prone to pride, arrogance, and uh, self-sufficiency. So forgive us of those things, God, and, and lead us to that place where we can again humble ourselves before you and even before each other. And uh, God, we just thank you for your forgiveness. We seek it. We want to extend it to others. So uh, help us do that this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.